Okay, so this is going to be a little video on phylogenetic trees, a little phylogenetic tree. Um, so, phylogeny. Phylogeny uh, is a sort of way of expressing evolutionary relationships. So classification is pretty much um, supposed to reflect the evolutionary relationships. So remember when we learned about, you know, the KPC, OFGS, you're assuming that everything in the same kingdom is more closely related to the things in that kingdom than it is to something in something else. All animals are more closely related um, to each other than they are to plants. And then within that kingdom, the, f the members of a single phylum, like the chordates, the things with backbones, they're all more closely related to each other than they are to the things without backbones. Within then a class like mammalia, we're assuming that all mammals are more closely related to each other than they are to, say, one of the reptiles. So this is, a phylogenetic tree is just a diagram that kind of shows that. And pretty much, when you're constructing it, you're assuming that key mutations that lead to that kind of divergence, that new species formation, are only happening just the once. So, you can see on my little diagram here, we've got common ancestry. This is what we've, this is in your booklet, isn't it? Common ancestry at the branches. So here, we've got a common ancestor to the reptiles and the mammals. So we're all in the same um, phylum, chordata. So turtles have a backbone underneath that lovely shell. And then we're saying that sometime way back in evolutionary history, we developed hair. Now we could have just done this for birds, I suppose, and had, you know, development of feathers and beaks and all the rest of it. Then moving into the order, carnivora, the thing that they all share in, in common is their teeth, which we remember if they've got the, those very sharp incisors, the canines, the carnassials. All of the uh, carnivores share those characteristics, so that mutation only needs to happen, the sort of suite of mutations only needs to happen the once. And then we've got you know, the dog family, and we're following the cat family through. So one, one thing that all cats share in common, no matter how big they are, is they can retract their claws. They just, you know, pretty much when they're eating, you choose not to. Um, and then, so we've got the non-purring, and then we've got this mutation that gives them the ability to purr, like your domestic moggy does. So our end branches, and of course, you know, I'm going to show you a bit more complicated phylogeny in a minute, uh, you know, might have more than one species on it and more than one genus on it, but that's the basic principle. So those key mutations often, you know, only happen once. Um, and that's certainly the basis of one of the questions in your uh, question two, I think, in your class questions book. So you should probably check that out too. So, just st sticking with um, phylogenies, the other way that you see uh, phylogenetic information is on a little tree of life like this, uh, with a time axis on it. And these branches uh, here represent common ancestors. So here is the common ancestor of all uh, six of those organisms. This one here is the common ancestor of B, C, D, E and F, but not of A. So these five are more closely related to each other than they are to A. The more recent the common ancestor, the more close the relationship. So these two have a quite recent common ancestor. Those two are the most closely related on that tree. So I'm hoping that that kind of makes sense. Um, the other way that you'll see these lineages is in really sort of really quite complicated looking diagrams. So I'm just sticking with the cat. This is in beautiful full colour in on Wikipedia, uh, so you can check it out. 
Uh, this is slightly more um, complex in that we've got a subfamily here. And we'll, let's ignore that and pretend that those words aren't there. So this is the family Felidae. So families tend to have that sort of suffix AE. They've branched out under two branches and we would call you know one branch a clade. So that's the clade for the big cats and this is the clade for the little cats. We've got a little bit of overlap there, just just a printing thing. Um, if we come down the sort of the the little cats one. Inside that we've got uh, some genera, so we've got the caracal, the leopard, the lynx, and um, the other ones. I wonder why we've not got a name there. Um, and then it ends up with the sort of the genera and the species at the end. So that, that can also reflect that classification and evolutionary relationships. So these are all just doing KPC OFGS down the side. Families, genera, and then species right at the end, puma, con colour, the cougar. So, how else might you see this data presented? So the other way that you can see this data presented is of course a lot of these are kept on computing computers now which then generate these uh, these phylogenetic trees and so what you might see is something like you know um, we'll stick with the cats again so we've got the file sort of carnivora which are, is the order and then inside that file you might have the families Canidae, which we're not going to open, and the file Felidae, which we are going to open, and then inside um, that family you might have genera like the lynx, and if you open that file you might then find your um, your species. So, lynx, lynx. <laughs> Nothing very clever about this, is there? And uh, lynx rufus. And you've got the genera, genera felis. And if you open that file, you would probably find felis sylvestris and which is the um, wildcat and Felis catus, imaginative name, the domestic cat. And then you might have, you know, so, and then you might have a kind of line going down to a different order, you know, so you might have the order um, Rodentia. Oh, can't spell, Rodent. And that would have then additional files in it. And of course, back here you would have, what would you have? What file am I in? You would have, you know, the core dates. And on these really complex trees, you would have um, perhaps another file on the Annelida, which is the earthworms, and with additional, you know, orders and then each one's got families inside of it and then each one's got genera and species. So you might see it, you know, kind of like that. And you can also work out your sort of common ancestry from there. See, so your common ancestors are there. For the earthworm and the chordates. And I think that's probably just about long enough for sort of phylogenetic trees and we'll do a bit of sort of evidencing them later on.